You can add it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank God. <laughs> uh, good morning, Sunita, and uh, welcome to Sedanta Talks. Uh, my name is Jack Donovan, and I'm uh, thrilled to have the opportunity to chat to you today. Um, when this all started off, what was it that actually drew you to rowing? What, what got your interest in rowing? Uh, I was picked up during the PE class uh, as one of the tallest girls from the class, and I actually never saw the rowing boat before in my life. And I thought, oh yeah, sounds fun, I'll try it. Mm -hmm. And then since I tried, I kind of fell in love with the sport soon after. And it was very exciting. First of all, I thought I'm going kayaking. And then I saw this boat where you sit in and you don't even see where you're going because you're rowing backwards. And then when we got in the boat, it just felt that it was moving so fast, even that there was only like two of us rowing at a time in the quad. And yeah, it was, it was pretty nice experience, I think. And I knew, I think, when I got in the boat then. It was my first rowing coach. She's always very happy for all the achievements. And after the Worlds, when I talked to her, she said she was, she didn't see the race, but she was somewhere in Russia, standing over the bridge and crying just because I won a medal. So that was very special. But was there a specific moment like, of memory to you when you knew or your family realized that there was a real talent there and that there was very much potential there for you to excel at rowing? Uh, well, I suppose my mom didn't want me to do rowing at first. She was like, oh no, you like, I don't know. It's like just the idea of being on the water all day. She didn't like it. And, uh, but then after I won my first sprint medal, she was like, okay, I suppose you can keep going now. And uh, yeah, there was no stopping after that. Uh, in 2006, you made the move to Ireland. Uh, at this point, was rowing still very much a priority for you? And was this still something that you were pushing forward in? No, actually, there was no thought about going back to rowing when we moved in 2006. Uh, my focus was purely on family life then and just living a normal life, I suppose, after retirement. When I was pregnant with Daniela, we went to that zoo and then we missed the turn and that's where it was like, I never actually knew where the rowing was in Dublin and that's where we discovered it. I was like, oh my God, there's a rowing in here. And that was it, it was like a switch. Uh, you began to compete for Ireland in uh, 2010. Uh, at this point, was it known that there was something in the water here in the National Rowing Centre in Farnwood and that it was going to continue to produce world champions like yourself? We started living in Dublin first and that's where the training started in, in the beginning, but then we were told if we actually want a really proper chance at the Olympics and everything, you have to be in Cork. And we were like, oh, okay. But we still, we did make a move and uh, never had any regrets about it. Uh, I think it's because the facilities here, and as you can see, it's a great facility, great stretch of water as well. It could be a bit less windy, but it's out of our control, unfortunately. And um, I think when the whole team comes in together here in Cork, you just see how hard everybody else is working, and you just pick it up, and, and that's how you keep going. Yeah. I suppose I should talk not just current coach, but all the coaches that have been coaching me here. I think. I am one of the athletes that probably had many coaching, coaches coaching me. There has been a lot of changes since I started here in 2010. And I suppose each one of them has given me like a set of tools that I can use on the water. Like uh, the first one was, let's say, tough as nails. So he'll just get your concrete pill in and off you go. Like there's no feeling sorry for yourself as the next one was more like a technical guru and he just taught me to be more efficient. So if I combine being more efficient and tough as nails, so that's already a good combination. And um, now obviously uh, I had another coach who taught me to be more independent, not to rely on coach to be there for me all the time. So and now we're here with this program which is absolutely insane and I said that I'm never going to do this but I am doing it and it's paying dividends so I suppose if you put all the things that I've been taught from all the four coaches it's yeah it just works. I suppose that kind of uh, plays into the, uh, into the next question in that there seems to be a, a common theme amongst champions in that there's a strong team around them to support them uh, week in week out with training uh, was this a difficult thing for you to achieve, I suppose, putting together the, the network and the team and the support you have now? Did that take long? 
Uh, you kind of build your support slow and steady, yeah. Like, when you arrive, you I didn't know anybody here when I arrived in Cork. I knew people in Dublin, but so I had to leave my Dublin support behind. Them. And I uh, suppose that people have been changing as well. I'm probably the oldest person here from the beginning. Mm. Like, oldest probably anyway. But uh, the longest that I've been here since 2010 and I've seen lots of people come and go and it is very important to have even being because being in a single is very lonely as well um, so for me that team environment is very important that's what makes it easier to train more enjoyable to train and obviously when we go away racing we support each other massively and uh, we live each other's successes failures and like it, it's really precious yeah it was pretty much from the beginning really, I've been very lucky, I think uh, the club was very supportive at first and then the whole rowing community has been really supportive, since, especially since I got into the single, I felt like they're almost like surging on, like it's really, really nice to experience that, especially knowing that I come from a different country, so that they have accepted and taken me on as their own and giving all the support, yeah, it's something special I think. Sport Ireland plays a massive role in our success. They're kind of a big piece of a puzzle. Apart from the carding system, they also provide us with uh, all the services necessary. So the psychology would be coming from them, and physiology, and physio, and everything really that we need outside of the water, we have uh, thanks to them. And I mean, they play a massive part. Let's say the physios, we go once a week just to keep us straight and out of injuries and it's so beneficial. And we learn, because of them, we learn so much about even efficient movement, just how to mind ourselves, how to deal with like niggles and things so we don't have to panic every time we feel, oh, I have a twinge there, so what do I do? They have educated us so far that we can actually manage it, like early stages of injury. Yeah, it's been a massive, massive support. Like, it's just, it's almost like if some, some of them won't provide any support for us, the, it won't be possible because you need everything they provide, you need it to succeed. Like all the components I mentioned before, is psychology, working with Paul and, and Kate Kirby, uh, has played a massive part. Same with uh, all the physios, Sarah Jane and Sinead and Eber lately stepped into the team as well. So they we know like an invisible team around us because you know they're always there if you need it. Even SNC Eamon is working with us. Like he's coming back, coming into court quite frequently. So we'll see him tomorrow working with us just so he can keep an eye that we're moving well, that we're progressing, hitting the targets that we need to hit in the gym. And yeah, it's, uh, you can't even put like a dollar sign on the support they give you. It's, it's massive. Uh, what is it that motivates you to come out here and train day in, day out, rain or shine? The motivation, uh, sometimes there's none. You just roll out of bed and then team carries you along. So that's where that team environment is very important. Sometimes you're the one who carries others. Uh, so, yeah, it's I so usually you, you do remember that final goal while you're doing this, but like everybody has the days when they don't want to go to work. There are days, most of the days it won't be an issue. Like if everything goes well, you feel good, you're looking forward to the work and the sessions are different. So it's, it's interesting enough. Uh, you know it's going to be hard, but you're ready for it. Uh, there are days when you don't feel as great and that's where your mentality kind of comes in and then you just, I tend to bargain with myself sometimes, I'm like, okay, just get through the session, if you're really, really tired you can cry after, you know, they won't be crying before the session because that's not the time for it. And then after when you finish, you're so happy you finished, there's no, you know, we're near to be crying, you know, <laughs> so it's kind of, or bargaining just get through the first 5k, get through the next 5k, then get through the 5k again and you just break the session into the sections so it doesn't feel overwhelming when you know, oh I have 26k to do today, I don't want to. So if you just don't think about it, you just go, okay, I do the warm up, then I do the next bit, then I get to the bridge, then I get back to the top, then I go back to the bridge. It makes it a bit more easier to do. 
or I don't know, just say, oh, if you do this, go and buy something nice, have a nice chocolate or something, you know. There's so many ways to bargain. <laughs> yeah, definitely, I've been working with Paul Gaffney and now I'm working with Kate Corby, so they're keeping me, my head in the right space, so it's very important. It almost seems like you, you feel more prepared now going into these competitions and you're kind of, you're really, yeah. you're really looking forward to it and ready to get into it. Yeah, like our training training program is absolutely brutal now, so we're actually looking forward to racing bit when mm. you can just take down the mileage and enjoy a few Ks in the morning, a few Ks in the evening, and then only 2K race. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the feeling is amazing when you just sit in a boat and it's just like the rhythm is there and you can hear the boat kind of travel and the bubbles going against the hull. It's and if it's nice and sunny, it's amazing. What does a typical day of training look like for you? So the typical day would be warming up, being here at half seven, then we spend about 30 minutes in the gym just to warm, loosening us, ourselves out and uh, activation work and uh, stretching. Then we'll go on the water and depending on the day, that could be like 20, 26K, depending what microcycle we're in and that could be steady it could be ut1 zone as well so we do the work that takes about two two and a half hours after that we have to go in and uh, back back inside and obviously getting warm is the priority again if it's really cold outside and the food so most of the time we'll have like a banana to eat straight after session or a protein milk that we drink straight away just to make sure we don't miss that recovery window then we get warm, shower, go upstairs and eat probably another bowl of porridge, porridge bowl two <laughs> during the day, or something else and uh, then we can go home and relax a little bit if there's only two sessions. If there's three sessions that day, then after about two hours we'll be going back out on the water again to do steady session or UT1 session depending on what's, what's on the schedule there. So that will take about an hour and a half or two hours again, depending on how long is the session. And uh, after that, if, it's, if there's a third session, obviously we come in again, we have to make sure we eat, recover, and a few hours later we'll be going into the gym to do strength and conditioning work, which will take about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, with all the stretching, warming up and, and cooling down. And then it's finally home time. So, as you can see, there's lots of food, 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 recovery, food, training, food, food. So we have to make sure that we take in those five, five and a half thousand calories. I think it's more for boys as well, so I don't know how they do it, <laughs> because it's, it is a chore sometimes to get all the calories in. Um, and yeah, and then rest in the evening or study or do some work and then all over again the next day. So it's fun. <laughs> and food wise, we made a massive change last year. Uh, we've been counting that on the average in a day I was missing about 1,000 calories up to 1,500, depending on the load of the day. And since we actually fixed it, I feel that I've had so much more energy to train. I've been ill less times, touched wood. And that, because I've been healthy, it just it's a very continuous process with training you don't miss out many sessions and that obviously is a massive benefit towards the final goal being the fittest you can for the main event. I know you've told this story about a hundred times already about that day in Plavdiv in Bulgaria uh, becoming the world champion but when you're at the when you're at the start of that race what's going through your head is there is there a certain thought process that you go through at the start of a race to prepare yourself or is your mind just blank? Uh, I was quite nervous like it was a very windy day as well and in the winds you never know like there's so many things can go wrong when you're racing so you have to learn to park all the all the warning thoughts like away but mm. it's really hard to do this when you know what's at stake so uh, I think the first not for the last thing I thought before I focused on my actual race was, oh, I'm not quite sure about that redraw of the lanes because it seemed windier on my side than it was on the other side, but it was helping Tailwind if you can manage it. And then I was like, okay, well, I am where I am, I can't change this now. So, and then I just focused on the 
what we've done in training so many times, the starts, the first 25 strokes of the start and then just carried on, like counting the strokes down. And I suppose at the other end of the race then, at the finish line, what, what feeling, what's that feeling uh, that you get that running through you once you cross that line? Yeah, and it's, I think it was very special because that was my first major medal um, and first world championship medal. Uh, but uh, it was more like the last 250 meters were so long. I was like, finally I finished it. And then it was like, like we did it. Like it was, it was great. I don't think I'll ever relive that moment again. It was helpful that yeah, there was um, the race plan was just go hard and go harder, and then the last strokes I don't even remember because like it was everything was left there. What would you like to see stem from this victory that you have? You know, what would you like to see that you've contributed to not just winning the world championship, but I suppose the knock-on effect that you might have created? I try not to kind of think about that much, but it's really nice to hear when somebody says oh you inspired us to go to the gym more often i'm like okay that's really nice and uh, if let's say some moms in their mid-30s say you know what i'm gonna go back to the running or something that's i think you can't ask for anything more really like it just shows that if somebody understands that there's no reason to give up on your dreams just because you become a mom like that's Amazing. And that's all I can ask. It's not rocket science, it's just science. Being a student of Satanta College and studying strength and conditioning, does having an understanding of sports science help you do what you do day in, day out? It does. Um, let's say training on a water when we do so many miles and so much intensity, um, uh, you need to know when keep pushing yourself or when to back off a little bit. Just not to go into that overtraining, not recovering properly, because that can be, re there's a really fine line, it can be very dangerous if you fall over the other side, there's, it's a long way to recovery. And uh, it's, sometimes it's scary, knowing how much we do and it, how easy it is to fall over, but because we do have a bit of knowledge gathered over the years, we can kind of, uh, it can definitely help to avoid it. Uh, what are your ambitions over the next 12 months? What do you want to achieve and tick off the list? Obviously, staying on top would be really nice. Mm. That's why we're here every morning and doing all the training. And uh, I haven't won Europeans yet, so that would be on a bucket list. That would be a nice thing to do. And the biggest one is obviously qualifying for Tokyo now in about 10 months' time. You're currently a student of Satanta College, um, studying strength and conditioning. In years to come, do you think maybe we'll see you coaching future champions? Maybe. Yeah. And they should be scared now. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be in trouble. <laughs> and from what I gather, it's quite possible you're maybe going to be coaching a, a future javelin champion in your daughter. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave Dad to deal with her. And um, finally, Sunita. What advice would you give to up-and-coming athletes who hope to achieve anything close to what you've done this year? Um, the journey is up and down, not to give up when it's down, but believe that you can still get on the top after being knocked down many times, I suppose. As long as you believe that you can be there, you will be. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.